Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Robert Brown, Senior Director of External Affairs, Too Simple, Jordan Coleman, General Counsel and Vice President of Policy, Kodiak Robotics, and Johnny Morris, Head of Policy and Communications on Bark Trucks. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Grayson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited to have you gentlemen here. You're some of the smartest minds in policy you're allowing autonomous trucks to run on roads, and you're doing a really good job, and your prospective companies are all leading in this. So to kick things off, Robert, I'll start with you. What is the current state of the autonomous trucking industry from a policy perspective? Good question, Grayson. Thank you for having me on, and Jordan and Johnny, always good to talk to you. We're doing quite well as an industry, I would say, and I think it's a testament to the core folks that work in this industry, we work very closely at a state and local level in all the states that we operate in. We all come from the adage, you know, we don't like to surprise anyone. And so working with new states that we're entering in, educating both state, local law enforcement, DOTs, the whole industry on what autonomous trucking is, honestly, sometimes more importantly, what it's not. Jordan's colleague, Dan, has done a great job, you know, at the CVSA working group, working on some of the core issues that we have to address with law enforcement and state DOTs, along with others. And then, of course, what we do, long haul trucking, is a a federal matter. And in working with our friends at USDOT and specifically FMCSA on, again, educating them on what we're testing today, what are our deployment plans, how this technology will be deployed, all these great questions that we have potential answers for, I should say. It's a collaborative opportunity. We are doing our best to educate members of Congress on the technology again, primarily working with state DOTs and law enforcement, along with all of our competitors and associations, and then, of course, our federal friends at uh, USDOT. Jordan, what are your thoughts? I completely agree with Robert. I think in the end, a lot of our efforts end up being more on the education side than anything else. I think Silicon Valley has long been plagued by the ideology of move fast and break things. I think when you're driving 80,000 pound trucks, that can't be the case. And so, you know, I laud my colleagues, Robert and Johnny on this call, as well as others within the industry for going out and proactively building relationships with our regulators and other partners in the states that we operate. I think trust is absolutely paramount in this industry and showing that deep commitment to engagement on a state, regional and local level, as well as that deep commitment to building those relationships first. And so, That's really been the focus for us at Kodiak, and I know for everyone on this call, is having those relationships and meeting with the relevant stakeholders, showing them what these trucks are capable of and showing them just how safe these trucks are going to make American roadways. John, you've done a really good job of that back from your time in government. And on the previous podcast that you were on, you gave advice to then-president-elect Biden and now President Biden. So I'd love to know what your thoughts are, Johnny, because you're two, three steps ahead of thinking this through. The thing to remember is that even though autonomous trucking is kind of a cutting edge technology, it's a it's an emerging industry. We're not entering into a, a blank slate from a regulatory environment perspective. There are plenty of requirements, rules, authorities that exist in the trucking industry today. And so part of our job is to make sure that we're navigating those correctly. We're building good partnerships, as Jordan and Robert alluded to. And then it's it's also looking at those authorities, looking at, at those requirements and saying, what doesn't really make sense for autonomous trucking and what needs to be added for autonomous trucking? So it's a constant in dialogue with our state partners, with our federal partners to figure out how we adapt the existing regulatory environment to meet the needs of, of the industry and of public safety. That's something that we've been working at at Embark and I know the other companies have been working at pretty much since since day one, that's something that, that we continue to do and, and we're really excited about. Staying on the theme of state partners, Robert, I'd love to know, why is the industry consolidating operations in Arizona and Texas? Jordan has operations with Kodiak and, and Texas, and you have them in, in Arizona. Why is there this massive consolidation in these two states? Well, I'd be remiss. Everyone 
forget it's about poor New Mexico, but New Mexico is a, a key component uh, between Arizona and Texas. And again, going back to all of our business models, that long haul segment of the middle mile that we're all trying to solve for. But yes, it is no surprise Arizona, New Mexico and Texas are pretty much mecca when it comes to AV trucks. I think everyone I know in our space that is serious in it are testing in some of those three states. And it has a lot to do with the regulatory environment. All three states now have legislation on the books that it allows AV testing and deployment. And then just the culture of working together, collaborative with state DOTs, law enforcement, and also just the business use case. I mean, there's just tons and tons of freights that moves up from Mexico, one of our largest trading partners. And then, of course, along I-10, 20 and 30, and then the Texas Triangle that Jordan's company is cracking as we speak. So it is a, it's a great place to operate. The weather is, is relatively, I want to call it good because it's, it gets a little wild with those rainstorms and haboobs and dust storms, but you don't get a lot of snow minus the deep freeze this year. You know, it's, it's no surprise that this technology will be, be first be tested in the Southwest and move out towards the Southeast and more of the Sunbelt states that are aligned both regulatory and from a business side as well. Jordan, Kodiak did the Dallas to Houston run with no disengagements. What was that like from a policy perspective? Did you have to brief local law enforcement and state officials? How could you talk about that from a policy perspective on that run that you did? Yeah, absolutely. I think this goes back to the point I made earlier. It's about establishing relationships. So before our trucks ever arrived in Texas, which was around July of 2019, we had sat down with the governor's office the state legislature in both chambers, DPS, Department of Public Safety, which is the Highway Patrol for Texas, as well as the regional and local partners in, in and around the DFW area, as well as in the Houston area, before we ever started running that lane. We obviously then built up that lane from a technological perspective, mapping it, burning it in, and otherwise, and then started working with our commercial partners to run that lane. And I think it's the transparency of what we're doing why we're doing it, why it's important. And it's about running these loads on real lanes with real times um, with real customers, right? We want to prove that this is not a science experiment. This is not something that any of the companies on this call, we're not contriving scenarios to drive in. Our customer's freight needs to get from point A to point B, and it needs to do so on time, and it needs to do so every time. And so I think doing it where there is traffic, where there is construction, where there are vehicles on the shoulder, and all the other complications that come from driving on the highway and delivering loads in real time was very critical. And I think it's an enormously important proof point for all of those public and private partners that we work with to show that this technology is real, it's here, and it's on your roads now safely delivering your freight and doing 100% of that on-road driving. I want to emphasize and point something out, and we've spoke to Johnny and Jordan and Robert about this on previous podcasts. Every single one of your companies has incredible leadership. Every single one of your companies is operating this as a business, and you're generating revenue. You're not putting out a fancy blog post, look what we did. No, you're actually doing runs and generating revenue. And so I give a lot of credit to your leadership at your companies because you have a clear focus on doing right on policy, doing right on safety, but then also doing right by your shareholders and investors of generating revenue. And Johnny, so that rings the question, is Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, are those the best places to deploy right now for long haul trucking and the applications that you and your colleagues are working on? Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree. For Embark, we have our operations center right now in in Fontana, California, and we generally run on the I-10 to Phoenix. The 800-pound gorilla in the room is is California, which is economically vital. The Southern California ports are a critical piece of the kind of freight ecosystem, and it's really important for autonomous trucks to be able to access that area. Unfortunately, California is a little bit behind the times in terms of the AV regulations in the state. At one point, they, they led, you know, they passed a bill in 2012 that directed the DMV to, to create regulations for testing and deployment of autonomous vehicles of all types. Early on, they kind of decided to first look at passenger vehicles. And so right now, it's not possible to operate at a level four level of automation, a vehicle over 10,000 pounds in California. So that's obviously problematic from a standpoint of looking at where this technology is going to be commercialized first. Those rules need to change before autonomous trucks can come to California in a, in a commercial way. And the challenge is right now, as Robert talked about a little bit about the CVS A work going on, there's a ton of work that needs to happen today to pave the road for autonomous trucks operating in a commercial basis in the coming years. Things like how you inspect the trucks, law enforcement interactions, infrastructure interactions, what type of data is being shared 
with the state? Are there different or better ways to structure work zones? All kinds of different things. That right now, all that work is happening with the states of, of Arizona, state of Texas, and their DOTs, and is not happening in California. So from the overlapping circles of commercialization policy and then kind of operational environment, that kind of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas corridor is is absolutely the, the best place to be. And just to piggyback on what Johnny says, it's all that stuff from a technical perspective and law enforcement, 100%, 100% agree. But also the soft the softer skills and the learnings that are happening in these communities and the hiring and what people get to be a part of these tech companies is really kind of cool to see throughout the whole industry. You know, as we've expanded outside of California, we obviously hire the best and brightest from Carnegie Mellon and all of our companies, you know, this wicked smart people, but we also hire drivers and machinists, folks that aren't normally a part of a tech company. And, you know, we recently IPO'd and those folks have to be a part of it, which is a really cool message and allows a certain segment of people that aren't normally a part of this kind of company. Our work with Pima Community College, I know Jordan and others are working with Dallas College. We're going to be doing something in Louisiana at the end of the month. People are, are afraid of the workforce impacts of autonomous vehicles, but all of our companies are actively participating in the future of work and what kind of great jobs these this technology will create. So it's, it's all the things Johnny led, but it's also the, the impacts that we have in the communities that we are you know, deploying this technology, which is, which is another uh, unfortunate, as a proud San Diegan, as a, as a, and I will always be a proud San Diegan that we're missing out on. Johnny, you operate in Fontana. Imagine you expand and California gets the rack together. You start creating more high paying tech jobs in Fontana. You have Brightline, which about about an hour and a half outside of Fontana and Victorville is going to be building a station there. You're going to have all these really great high paying jobs in in rural suburban communities, and it's going to have a positive economic impact on those communities. Maybe somebody can open a new hamburger store or send their kids to a private school. It's going to have this really positive impact. And Johnny, I want to stay on California because the regulations in California to autonomous trucks are, let's just put it this way, not very nice. But Goldman Sachs recently came out with a report that it's now taking six days to unload cargo ships instead of two days due to a lack of trucks at the Port of LA. The Port of LA is one of the largest ports in the United States. Autonomous trucks could fill this, create new jobs because you have more individuals loading trucks. Couldn't California look and say, wait a second, autonomous trucks will have a positive economic impact, not just on San Pedro where the port is, but on the state by creating these jobs. Can't you use something like that and say, hey, California, there's an economic opportunity here to create really great high paying jobs. And oh, by the way, it's going to lower the cost of goods to the consumer. So it's going to benefit both the angles. Absolutely. I think it's all that. And then if we think about what the state of California's top priorities are, climate change and vehicle emissions are a huge, a huge point of focus for the Newsom administration, for the legislature. Automation is something that can be adapted for any drivetrain, whether it's diesel, natural gas, or electric vehicles. Furthermore, what we've seen is that automation can take any drivetrain and make it more efficient because it's a more efficient driver than a human driver. So it's not slamming on the brakes. It's not slamming on the gas. It knows exactly how much it needs to accelerate and decelerate. So we've seen real world estimates and some of the research that Robert's company has done suggests 10% fuel savings on the same vehicles, but just driven autonomously versus human driven. There's industry research that suggests that the top end of that is around 30%. There's about a 30% spread between the best, most efficient driver in a fleet and the worst driver in a fleet. And if automation can be the best driver all the time, every day, every mile, there can be huge fuel savings just with the existing kind of technology, drivetrain technology that exists. The other thing I'd add is there's an interest in the Newsom administration has put out some goals for the adoption of zero emissions trucks. Obviously, long haul technology for electric trucks doesn't exist yet. The battery capacity isn't there. The the charging infrastructure isn't there. But we're starting to be on the cusp of short haul trucks being electrified, zero emissions Based on our business models, I think across all of our companies that look at automating the middle mile and basically creating more short haul routes that are serving long haul automated routes, it's easy to see how that could drive adoption of electric zero emissions trucks on the short haul, especially in places like where we operate in Fontana, where there are huge air quality issues because of the amount of trucks. And there's also huge equity issues because of the the people that live in that region having to be close to these trucks operating. So I think there, you know, to your point, autonomous trucking is tremendously aligned with the goals of California. And it's our job to just make sure that folks are hearing that over some of the kind of 
sensationalized concern trolling that exists about the industry. Short haul electrification makes a lot of sense. You're seeing Gattuck AI doing it down in Arkansas with Walmart where they're running the electric box trucks 10 miles, 20 miles. That makes a lot of sense. Jordan, will we ever get to the point where we see class eight trucks fully electrified or is it just going to take too much strain on the energy grid and you're not going to get the miles that you're needed in order to move your goods? I think it's absolutely a when and not an if. I think that this that technology and our technologies will be melded at one point in time. Electric drivetrain tends to be much more simple than a diesel drivetrain. And so from an actuation and automation perspective, it's something that's easy to be able to do or relatively easy. My engineers will get mad whenever I say things are easy. But I think the other thing I'd add is that autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucks specifically, they're here now, right? As we discussed, we are delivering goods disengaged free on I-45 between DFW and Houston right now. And so they're, the key is, is to allowing autonomous truck technology to continue to advance, to allow our vehicles to deploy, and so that all of the communities in which we operate can take advantage of the panoply of benefits that this technology provides, right? We've touched on it. It's safety. It's, it's fuel efficiency and emissions reductions. It's efficiency in the supply chain and driving down the cost of goods to ultimate consumers. It's even things like reducing congestions on roadways, right? None of the three companies, our trucks don't care if it's three in the morning or three in the afternoon. They can drive when it's convenient. They can reduce traffic on roadways during peak traffic times. Therefore, frankly, increasing the economic output of everyone by instead of sitting in their car, they're at work or they're with their kids or they're et cetera. And so it's about bringing that panoply of benefits now. And then when the timing is right on the electrification side, it's about integrating these two technologies together, which from everything I've been told by the people at my company much smarter than me is something that can be accomplished relatively easily. It's just a matter of when that technology is ready and driving the autonomous piece forward now while we can, and then integrating in the long haul. Your technology is great, but you know where I'm going. you, you got to figure out and ask your engineers how to play the honk game. So when your truck's going down there with nobody and the nice little kid goes by and, and plays the honk game, you got to figure out the honk game. That's the most important part of seeing a truck on the road. Grayson, as I have told you from day one, I am a Midwest boy who grew up literally sitting backwards in a station wagon, staring at the trucks, pulling my arm up and down, asking for the air horn. So if our perception system, and I mean not Kodiaks, but the industry as a whole, cannot identify that and cannot honk the horn, in the long term, I agree we failed as an industry. You got to do it. You're going to make the road safer. Your drivers are not going to get distracted because they're fully autonomous. They're going to play the honk game with children. You're going to reduce the carbon output by saving fuel. So Robert, putting this all together, this seems like this is the perfect opportunity for California because you're fully aligned with the Newsom agenda. So what can be done to welcome autonomous trucking in the state of California? Great question. It kind of goes back to what Johnny said. When we when we first got rock and rolling, we were a pretty pretty small industry. It was Johnny, I call him the godfather, you know, <laughs> of, of the industry. But it was a very small group, very relatively small companies. That is not the case. What we call our ecosystem partners, partnering every major OEM, our partner Navistar has you know, jumped two feet in with our, our projection truck. UPS, McLean, upstream, downstream, shippers, insurance, technologists. There's a emerging ecosystem that not just supports you know the two simple Kodiaks and Embarks of the world, but the whole transportation industry. And 70% of all of our goods moved on a truck at some point. The adage may say, if you bought it, a truck brought it. Everyone needs capacity right now. They need in-time shipping, whether that's fresh produce, e-commerce, or some of the other verticals that we're that we all are looking at. But it is it is a mature industry. I mentioned all the OEMs and all of our key partners at our company and 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 the ecosystem. That if California does this, it is a, a true game changer from an economics perspective. You know, I like to point people to a Volpe study that came out a few months back and that really showed that this technology, if done well, will actually grow the GDP, which is a lot of technologies can't say that. And, you know, actually put more money in average Joe's pocket, you know, at the end of the month due to this this type of game changing technology. So we are a lot more mature. Hopefully we're trying to work hand in glove with our, our friends in California and show them all the different benefits from the safety benefits, the economic benefits, the workforce benefits. You know, so over the next few months, you'll be seeing more of us in Sacramento, I'm sure, and hopefully making some headway there. I love, love, love the line, if you bought it, a truck brought it. That's awesome. That is flat out awesome. Go ahead, Johnny. 
Yeah, I was just going to say on that, that Volpe study is great. It's a federally funded study. And I was just going to say, can we can we drop a link in the show notes? Absolutely. I always, I always listen to podcasts and people are always saying, let's drop a link in the show notes. I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll put this the Volpe study in the show notes. So be sure to read it because autonomous trucking will have a positive impact on the economy, but it's also going to have a positive impact on millions of individuals around the world. And Johnny, are there other states besides California that are putting up speed bumps or roadblocks or trying to slow walk this technology? Or is California kind of the outliner there? What we spend a lot of our time doing, you know, we've talked about education before, and we see a lot of things, you know, there are a lot of bills every year that I've been doing this. There's a larger and larger number of bills that come up across different states, of people that want to do things about the AV industry. And I think they correctly recognize that it's a it's a growing and emerging and rapidly maturing industry. And, and obviously legislators want to legislate. But one is that we see a lot of bills that don't really think about vehicle types. And so they'll you know, they'll put some requirement or theorize about some requirement that would kind of make sense maybe for passenger vehicles, but wouldn't make any sense for trucks. And so we have to kind of go in as an industry and say, actually, you know, the AV industry is really broad and we need to think about unintended consequences. So I'd say a lot of the challenges that we see at the legislative level are just a, a challenge of needing to do more education and needing to help legislators and their staff think through the unintended consequences of what they're trying to achieve and then figure out better ways of, of wording something or, or better ways of getting it at something that they want to do with the input of industry. And, and I think all of our companies and the industry groups that we're a part of really pride ourselves on working collaboratively, both with legislators and with other stakeholders that might be involved in the legislative process to come to good results. Every once in a while, someone will pop up with a bill that is just kind of like, we don't like autonomous trucks, but those generally don't go far because I think most most legislators across most states recognize the importance of the industry, want to support it. Certainly, there's interest in, in wanting to, to have some oversight or some understanding of what's going on, and we're happy to provide that. But we don't see a lot of roadblocks that are intended to be roadblocks, I'd say. The other thing I'd add to that quickly, I think Johnny hits on a really important point, which is that if you go back 10 years ago in the AV industry, it was effectively entirely passenger car focused. And so much of the education that happened to relevant public stakeholders in all of these states was around passenger vehicles. And what you've seen is a big shift over the last couple of years from passenger vehicles to trucks, including a couple of large incumbents in the AV space who've chosen to focus more on trucks, be it the three of the companies that are on this call that are three truck specific, autonomous truck specific companies. You've seen a growing focus and a growing understanding of the promise of what this technology means in the long haul trucking space. And I think a lot of it, when you can get in and you can have these meetings, you can have these conversations, the light bulb goes on quite a bit to say, hey, this isn't how are these cars going to drive around in my dense urban area? Or, hey, I don't really need this technology. Sure, I grew up with the Jetsons and I know I'm aging myself. So it'd be great for my car to fold up into a suitcase and to fly me to work every day, but I don't need that. And when you contrast that with saying, there are not enough truck drivers to support the demand today. There is growing throughput, be it because of the rise of e-commerce and otherwise. There's a critical need for these technologies in order to ensure the goods are getting where they need to and when they need to, right? I think the past year has only hammered home that, right? For the first time in my life, you'd walk into stores and there would be empty shelves. Obviously, we all couldn't get enough toilet paper when we thought we needed it. Although, obviously, we all did get enough toilet paper, but that's neither here nor there. But we've seen kind of shelf and food and other insecurities over the course of the last 18 months that we hadn't seen before. And I think that's really hammered home for people, the absolute critical need to start preparing for autonomous truck technology in their states in the near term. It will be a state that will be unnamed, but I had a meeting a couple of weeks back and I went into it with some enthusiasm but skepticism across the table. And when I left that meeting, the answer was, what can we do to prepare our state next for autonomous trucks? I do agree. I think this is a big opportunity to further the conversation, deeper the conversation, and help people understand what autonomous trucks bring to the table, which I think is a really, it's a new point of view. That's a great point because we all saw the disruptions to the supply chain during COVID and autonomous trucks as the industry matures will short the supply chains. Going back here, Jordan, maybe two, three years ago when you said, oh, I'm in autonomous trucking, were they thinking, oh, this is the Google Firefly car, they're building one of those? Is that were those some of the early perceptions because it was all passenger, passenger, passenger and the Firefly car with Secretary Fox riding around with Eric Schmidt at that time? That was a very popular. Did you have to get over those notions to explain we're actually building a truck, not a Firefly car? 
again, I think it's the public's imagination that was really grasped by it. You saw it on the federal level, you saw it on the state level. And frankly, I think you saw it in the individual imagination. A lot of us, myself at the front of that line, commute too much a day. And so the idea of taking a nap, getting some work done, catching up on Game of Thrones, I guess I'm a little dated with that reference, but that was all very exciting for people. And so that's all people thought about was, okay, when when is my car going to drive me? Or when is there going to be this fleet of robo-taxis out there that can take me safely wherever I want to get to? And it's been that shift. It's been that shift in mindset. So that when I walk in office, they're saying, wait, this is trucks? And I say, yes. And here's that panoply of benefits we talked about. Here's how we're going to make roads safer. Here's why this is really economically critical. And I think it's been touched on, right? Whether it's a gallon of milk that costs five cents less for every consumer in the markets that that these trucks operate, whether it's saving lives, reducing injury crashes, reducing property crashes, the benefits of this technology are so concrete as opposed to call it uh, more whimsical potentially on the passenger side. And I think people are really grabbing a hold of the possibility of these trucks and what they can mean for their states, for their communities, and for the safety and efficiency of their roadway. Robert, at the federal level, since autonomous trucking has been proven time and time again, and we can look at data from the trucking industry that the impact on the economy is tremendous. How do you engage with with elected officials on a federal level? Is it a different conversation than you're having on a state level? Could you kind of shed some light to those conversations? When we have, and we do a lot of these jointly, actually, when we have our conversations at USDOT and FMCSA, you have a very sophisticated folks that have been working in this space for, for quite a few years. And there's a there's a lot of understanding about the technology. There's a lot of understanding about our specific companies, USDOT with, in the Obama administration, in the last administration, and, and this continued administration has prioritized AVs. It's still early days, but we are encouraged by Secretary Buttigieg and, and, and where they're going. They actually just sent out their calendar for rulemaking, and I know this stuff shifts, but our NPRM that we're all looking forward to for the safe integration of commercial motor vehicles is right now scheduled for October, which is exciting for our industry because, again, working at the federal level, as, as Johnny and Jordan touched on, because trucking is a, a very highly regu- regulated industry, there are some regulations that we need to get in, interpretations on, and, and the key guidances have been laid out very clearly, and, and and taking those through the rulemaking process is, is something that we're all very excited and eager to continue to work on. And then on Capitol Hill side, it's a little more of uh, just kind of what we do at the state, educating folks, letting people understand the the benefits of AV trucks, especially when we're in, in someone's state or, or congressional district, understanding how we work with folks. So it, it's a lot of more just general education on, on, on Capitol Hill. We are relatively fortunate we're not actively pushing an AV bill for autonomous trucks, which has proven difficult over the last few years due to many different factors. Do you need an AV bill for trucks or are you able to operate over state lines today? We are able to operate over state lines today. And so you're developing the the policies and working with local and state officials to develop the routes that you need for the trucks then? And then once you have all those state policies in place, your trucks are good to operate? Pretty much. You know, there's no requirement that all of our companies do what we do, but we we do it in concert with each other and we do it in concert with, like we've mentioned, you know, our state and locals, you know, you, know, you never want to surprise anyone. As a former state employee, yeah, the worst thing you could do is surprise someone and, and get pulled into your boss's office and they weren't aware of something. And that's why we've always, you know, with the notion of, of, like Jordan mentioned, you know, going into a state before we ever get in there. We recently hired a former 20-year veteran of the law enforcement community out of Arizona and he, he's wearing out his uh, American Airlines and Delta flights right now and driving his RV across the Southeast as, as too simple as expanding towards the Southeast, making sure he's meeting with all these key state partners, his former colleagues that have questions. You know, there's a lot of questions related to AV trucks. So, again, just making sure we are good citizens and, and you know, educate both our government partners and our com- community partners before we deploy in the state. Yeah, I think there's a couple a couple kind of misnomers about what autonomous trucks do and don't need from a from a regulatory and legislative standpoint that, that are worth talking about. So one is there's a sense of like the AV industry needs a big bill to be able to operate. And and part of that is rooted in the fact that there's been a couple of attempts in Congress to have a comprehensive AV bill passed that have, have kind of gotten scuttled due to a lot of different kind of political crosswinds. You know, that bill is really about 
novel vehicle design and, and exemptions to FMVSS. So if you want to build an autonomous vehicle with, that doesn't have a steering wheel, that doesn't have traditional seating, things like that, some companies need these these exemptions or are interested in these exemptions. That is actually doesn't have anything to do with the kind of core self-driving technology, right? You can have a, a vehicle that has all of the FMVSS required safety equipment on it, like our trucks, like all of us are building off of truck platforms that already meet all those requirements. And you don't need to take the steering wheel out to make it self-driving. And then the second misnomer is it's basically the Wild West, right? That there's no rules for autonomous trucks. And the fact of the matter is the trucking industry is heavily regulated at the federal level. There's a ton of authorities, right? If a vehicle, regardless of if it's autonomous or not, if a commercial vehicle is thought to be unsafe, if there's reason to think that it's unsafely operating, it can be pulled over and put out of service until it's proven otherwise. And so the idea that there's no rules for what we're doing is really not true. There's ample authority that exists at FMCSA and at the state level to ensure the safety of these vehicles. And so really, to Robert's point, it, it's really just about kind of education and not surprising people and, and taking them along every step of the way. But we're lucky in that we're in a position where we're not like having to pass a bill. And, and if we don't pass the bill, then the, the whole industry gro- goes away. We're in pretty good shape. Jordan, as the lawyer on the, this podcast, care to share your thoughts? First of all, uh-oh, you call me the lawyer on this podcast. It's really dangerous. <laughs> I tend to find myself as the lawyer on these podcasts. No, I, I think Johnny makes a great point, right? There is an, an immense regulatory body of rules that trucks need to comply with. And our trucks are no different from every other truck on the road in terms of having to comply with that in-depth set of rules. The same holds true with our states. Our states consistently, all all of the bills that have been passed say autonomous trucks must be able to comply with the rules of the road as laid forth in those states. And so we do need to make sure. Now, Now, of course, the one thing I love about our trucks is that when you say, hey, truck, you can only go exactly the speed limit or below, there's never a risk that the truck's going to go faster, right? And I think there's some of those aspects that where, where when you check the box, it's in pen, not in pencil with an autonomous truck, because you're able to program your system to, to be able to comply very specifically with the rules of the road. The amount of times I've gotten questions saying, well, how long in advance of the dotted line do I need to put on my blinker? What is, you know, a dotted line on this side or a double? It's white, it's a yellow line. And, and my engineers factor in those rules of the road as they're developing these vehicles so that they're ensured to to comply at a 100% level with those rules of the road. And so if anything, I think our trucks are some of the best actors on the road. They don't get drowsy. They don't get distracted. They don't text and drive. They always comply with the rules of the road. And so I think we on the, the three of us on this call, and I think, think the industry as a whole, is very focused on on safety as our absolute North Star. And so I think complying with those rules, being a good actor on the roads, and always ensuring compliance is something that, that our companies on the whole are fundamentally aligned on and, and always being a good actor. It's trust. Aut- autonomous trucks are trustworthy. You do not have to, if I'm, my wife's taking our daughter for a ride and there's a too simple, an Embark or a Kodiak truck, I'm not going to worry because your trucks are great drivers. They'll be frank. They're the best drivers. They're not going to get distracted. They're not going to have an emotional thought go through their head. They're not going to rush to get there. You, you gentlemen and your companies are doing things right and you're making the roadways safer for everybody and having a positive impact on the economy. Robert, as Too Simple expands and you're adding on new routes, what role does policy play in that? Is it you have to go and meet meet everybody ahead of time, like what Jordan was talking about in Texas, and get everything lined up and goes into the whole common theme of this podcast of no surprises? You know it. And then we, we have fun things like we're doing at the end of the month in Louisiana and Baton Rouge. Our folks, uh, we've been working with Pima Community College for quite some time, developing new innovative certification programs for companies like Too Simple and others to hire. And, and, and kind of like I mentioned before, looking at these new jobs that are created, you don't need a, a four-year degree to, to be a part of. We're doing this a really cool event in, in Baton Rouge. The Louisiana Secretary of Transportation is coming, potentially even some a few members of Congress. It's going to be a great event talking about workforce, talking about the economic impact of AV trucks in the state of Louisiana. And those are the type of events that I've learned are, are, are very important because it's an opportunity for people that are nervous about the technology come talk to our driver, talk to our engineer, talk to me, talk to Jay, talk to Gary, but put a face with the robot, right? And then once you have had those conversations, I've learned over time that anxiety level does go down. 
and I'm always very sensitive when I'm out there talking about this technology. There are people that put food on their table by driving a truck. And I am incredibly confident that that person will be able to retire a truck driver if he or she chooses to be. Hopefully their job will be better. It will be, they'll be home more often, that kind of thing. But the the notion that the robots are coming and, and they're coming for our jobs is, is a misnomer and too simple. And I know these companies that on this call are always very sensitive about that and, and articulating and educating folks that might be a little nervous. And I understand they're nervous when they when they read our headlines and stuff like that. But once you have an opportunity to sit down and explain what the technology is, again, what it's not, how, the, how they could see themselves fitting in in the relative near future in the AV transportation system, it's a true benefit for all parties involved. Johnny, let's stay on the workforce here for a moment. You chime in from an Embark perspective, please. Yeah, I absolutely agree with with what Robert said. I mean, I think there's one of the philosophies that we've taken, and I think is probably true for the other companies, but I'll just speak about Embark for a second, is our co-founders were competitive roboticists. So they're not, they didn't come from the software world. They came from a, let's build a physical object in the, that's trying to actually accomplish a, a specific task. And the thing that they always talk about is it's always way more complicated than you think. So the best thing you can do is make make your robot, make your product as, as simple as possible in a way that still accomplishes the task. And that's why you've seen a lot of companies take the kind of middle mile approach or if you want to call it the transfer hub approach, where what you're trying to do is automate the things that are easiest to automate, that have the biggest economic impact, and you're not trying to automate everything all at once, right? So human truck drivers are good at a lot of things and do a lot of things beyond truck driving, right? There are customer relationships, there's truck loading, there's paperwork, there's short haul driving off highway where you're improvising. I mean, if you've ever seen these trucks kind of have to navigate off highway, that's tough, you know, a parked car here or truck there. And all of a sudden they're doing this very delicate ballet through wide right hand turns and things like that. That stuff is really hard to automate in environments that are constantly changing with cyclists, with pedestrians, with people's pets running around. We're not trying to automate that. And I think there's plenty of work to be done kind of on that short haul ecosystem. So what we're trying to automate are these multi-lane divided limited access highways for long stretches where humans get fatigued, humans get distracted. You're sitting there hours of time and your phone is right there and you're thinking maybe I should just check a, a text or something like that. That's the stuff that humans aren't good at. And that's the stuff where you see really, really bad crashes. We try and focus on that. And I think because that's how the industry is approaching it, there's still going to be plenty of work for truck drivers. And that's before we talk about the tens of thousands of truck drivers that are needed to enter into the workforce in the next few years to help solve both the current driver shortage that exists, as well as the massive demand for truck miles that's going to grow in the coming years. Jordan, what are your thoughts from a Kodiak perspective? Yeah, no. First of all, I'm going to steal a line from Robert, which is, if you were to decide to get into the truck driving profession today, you will retire a truck driver. There's an enormous need for high quality individuals for who, who drive trucks and drive them in an unbelievably safe fashion, who work really hard to ensure that the lifeblood of the American economy continues to move, right? If you bought it, it's been on a truck and, and, and it, it's been a human driver who's driven it. I think, as Johnny laid out, we're all focused on this middle mile automation not only is that going to allow people to be able to stay closer to home, to be able to be home for dinner, to be able to make it to that football game or that piano recital, but it's also going to increase the throughput and the need for local and regional drivers by being able to have these trucks driving at 23 plus seven and therefore delivering more freight into markets that then need to get to their end their end destination. And so there is the ability to create those local and regional driving jobs that allow people to work a 10, 12 hour day and then to be home with their family at night, which is fantastic. Additionally, and this was touched on at the beginning of it. So not only is there the truck driving piece of it, and is there, by the way, as Johnny mentioned, the 60,000 plus truck driver shortage, that's a number from 2019 that's expected to grow significantly. And again, we talked about the increase in e-commerce and that's only going to drive the need for more truck drivers. And so when you combine those again with the, the other jobs that this industry brings, what I like to call the light blue collar jobs, the autonomous truck technician, that is a job of the future. And that is a job that, that this technology is going to bring to the United States and to markets everywhere. And so we're not only going to be able to help preserve and increase short and, and regional driving jobs, as well as a ton of manually driven long haul jobs, but also to be able to increase that kind of light blue collar workforce that I think is critical to grow in the United States. Autonomous trucking 
will create jobs. The truck drivers of today will retire truck drivers if they choose to. And the truck drivers today are some incredible men and women that put in long hours to ensure that our milk can get there, our Amazon package can get there. And there's some incredible human beings that are that are sacrificing so we can have a better quality of life. And to the truck drivers out there, thank you so much for delivering and, and putting in the long hours because we really appreciate it. And you are the backbone of this, this economy. Robert, we, we're all seeing during the pandemic, e-commerce went bonkers. There's no other word to describe it, but absolutely bonkers. It's projected to grow another 18% this year. Are companies such as Too Simple, are you working with your partners to shore up the e-commerce supply chain as you look to develop new routes? There's a distribution warehouse here to go to, say, let's go to an airport here. Are you kind of working with customers since e-commerce, in my opinion, is only one way. It's not going to slow down. It's just going to keep on growing. Yeah, yeah, Grayson, I think you're right. And I think as everyone saw you know, during the pandemic, the on-demand you needed here today, <laughs> I bought my kid a baseball mitt yesterday and he asked is, is it coming today and i was like oh my gosh what have i created you know <laughs> but yeah that 100 percent. i think e-commerce is is definitely the one that is very interesting for too simple we work with the ups which obviously does a lot of e-commerce and, and others do where have other partners as well it's an interesting vertical because when you have that just-in-time freight and also i think there's an opportunity to also look at when you have AV trucks, and granted, this is a future statement and future state, obviously, after there's some deployment, you can almost start reevaluating your supply chain a little bit and how you can adjust some of those distribution centers when you don't have the the hours of service requirements that you would when you have an AV truck. And when it comes down to the velocity and the speed to get to, to your customers, because, right, you know, building building those mega distribution centers near the, the dense urban areas where it's a basically like a hub and spoke delivery, but increasing that that throughput in the middle mile that we're all trying to address is a, is very exciting, not just for too simple, but the overall global economy. The thing I'd add to, right, if you rewind five years in Silicon Valley, the catchphrase was software is eating the world or digital transformation is being undergone by by every company, brick and mortars as well. I would also ask a question, somewhat tongue in cheek, because I know this isn't one hundred percent true. But what commerce isn't e-commerce anymore, right? When did we used to? When did we used to get protein and fruits and veg and et cetera purchased online, delivered through e-commerce methods and et cetera, right? Like what e-commerce is has fundamentally changed. It used to just be kind of consumer goods that were bought online, non-perishable consumer goods. It's grown enormously. And, and, and I think that's really a fundamentally key point here is that all commerce is becoming e-commerce. It's all being shipped and it's all being shipped via truck. And so that only underscores the critical need for this technology. That's a valid point. I ordered groceries online today. It was great. And, it's, and they're going to ship in a truck. And Johnny, let's stay on the, the grocery agriculture theme here for a minute. Because the World Bank's projecting the global population to be 9.7 billion by 2050. How can autonomous trucking be used to ensure fresh foods are delivered to stores to feed this ever-growing population? That's a great question. And I think it really highlights one of the benefits of autonomous trucking that people don't necessarily think about. So a lot of people think about, okay, you're automating something that a human used to do. And we're generally used to thinking about, you know, oh, a robot replaced a worker and that saves someone money somewhere. But what we're really talking about is adding an additional tool to the entire kind of freight logistics ecosystem, right? So you have things that move on rail, things that move on truck, things that move on plane, Different goods move different ways depending on where they're going and how valuable they are and et cetera. Now we're adding an autonomous truck, which has a little bit different characteristics. It's something that can go from coast to coast in two days because it can't, doesn't have to stop for rest breaks, doesn't have hours of service limitations the way drivers do. And so, you know, that's a trip that usually takes five or six days for a human driver, unless you're, you have team drivers, which then you've increased your cost by two on the labor side. And so really, you, if you think about agriculture, California, there's all kinds of different fruits and vegetables that are grown here and shipped all over the country. So strawberries, for example, grown in the Central Valley. Valley I think it's something like 75% of the strawberries that we eat in the U.S. come from California. So that truckload of strawberries is getting picked in California. It's getting put on a truck and it's driving five days to the East Coast. And then it gets put on a shelf and hopefully purchased in a day or two. And then it's taken home and hopefully eaten in a day or two because by then they're pretty ripe. And so if you can cut three days off that journey, you've just added three days of shelf life to those strawberries. And so when you think about all the food that's wasted, 
the the water and soil resources that go into growing that food. You know, with the amount of people we have on the planet and the amount of people that are going to be on the planet, we're running out of space. We got to get more efficient. And if we can make the supply chain more efficient and use more of what we're already growing, that can really be a game changer. And that goes for any product. And so, you know, maybe you start taking some products off of planes, which can move really fast, but are incredibly greenhouse gas intensive way to, to move freight. And you put them on autonomous trucks because it can't make the trip in five hours, but it can make it in two days. And maybe that's fast enough. So by adding a, another tool to this way that we move goods around the country, one that has nearly the speed of planes and nearly the low cost of rail, it really can transform a lot of different industries that have things to, to move, whether it's retail goods, agriculture, raw goods for manufacturing. It's really critical to the U.S. global economic competitiveness, as well as the kind of food resources that, that you spoke about. Not only that, the food will be healthier. It'll be, it'll be better tasting and think about for restaurants. And Robert, too simple, recently delivered some produce for a customer. Can you talk about that run, please? Some watermelons came up out of uh, Nogales with our partner, Gumara. We ran it autonomously from Tucson to Dallas and manually driven on each, each side of that. It's actually an idea I think all of us have been working on for quite some time. I think even I'll, I'll call out Richard Bishop and his ripe tomatoes, a few AVSs back. And it is an important vertical, as Johnny mentioned, because... 30 to 40% of our, our fresh produce never makes it to its final destination, our bellies, which is a, with the amount of hunger and food insecurity out there, that, that is a travesty. And not that autonomous trucks will solve that completely, but the last data I've seen around 15% of that waste is related to transportation issues and capacity issues. In our work with the Arizona food banks, every dollar they have to spend on, on transportation is one less dollar that they can do to meet their ultimate customers serving the Southern Arizona folks that, that need food. One thing that they've taught us is it is a transportation issue. The Feeding America Network balances foods around the country. And as Johnny mentioned, the Southwest is rich in produce and the Northeast isn't. And so they they balance each, each other with dry goods and, and fresh produce. But getting that fresh produce elsewhere in the country is, is a transportation issue. And having AV trucks, as Johnny mentioned, the potential speed of AV trucks and the lower costs and, and also just capacity because the trucking market cyclical. So during growing season, the height of lettuce season is all coincides with Christmas and, and Hanukkah buying, you know, and gift buying. So it that drives transportation costs up. So anything that we can do to increase capacity and increase opportunity will both help, you know, from a carbon perspective, hopefully from an equality perspective, and greater access, like you mentioned, Grace, into nutritious, healthy food, keeping people off of getting diabetic and other things. To add to that, right? We often talk about how there's a moral imperative to put this kind of technology when it's safe enough. When we can pull the driver, it's imperative to put this technology on roads in order to save lives. I think the same moral imperative is there to, in order to be able to in order to be able to help feed people, in order to be able to help people's lives be that much more nutritious, in order to be able to reduce emissions, right? I think there's a real moral moral imperative to putting this technology on the roads and doing it in the right way. And so I'm very lucky and honored to be able to work with my colleagues Robert and Johnny and the rest in this industry who really do believe in the potential of, of this technology to to not only address critical needs of the supply chain and otherwise, but frankly to make our country and our world a better place. It is going to have a positive impact on the world. It's going to do incredible things. It's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But Jordan, overall, what are the business opportunities for autonomous trucking? I read about the Kodiaks expanding to Asia. But besides, what are the real true business opportunities here? No, it's a critical point, right? I mean, in the end, you're building a business. You're not building a nonprofit. But to the extent we can help people along the way, all the better. I think the business opportunity for this technology is enormous, right? I mean, ATA estimates that the total addressable market for the, the need for trucks is about $800 billion a year. In Asia, it's about $1.5 trillion, and, and worldwide, it's north of $4 trillion. So there's an enormous need. There's enormous business opportunity. You combine with that the kind of driver shortages that we, met, that we mentioned before, there's not enough people. So there's not enough supply to meet the demand of moving the stuff around. And then you add in it the obvious cost that comes with attraction and retention issues and the like. There's a critical need for our carrier and our shipper partners to be able to move freight efficiently from point A to point B. There's not enough people that are able to do it. And then you add into it the obvious economic loss that comes from either the spoilage that was mentioned for produce or from the property damage and other accidents that happen on highways. There's an enormous economic need for this technology. Again, I think most most importantly is there's the opportunity for those those cost savings to be passed along to the average consumer. And so, there, so therefore, for people to get a gallon of milk five cents cheaper or the, or the like. Autonomous trucking will have a positive impact 
on society. And autonomous trucking will be an extremely profitable business. And gentlemen, as we look to wrap up this extremely insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? And Johnny, since you're one of the first guests on the road to autonomy, sir, way back when, I'll start with you. Thanks, Grayson. Yeah, it's been great to spend some time with with you and Robert and Jordan. I guess I'd say two things. One, because the, this industry is so interesting, we've been blessed with a lot of really bright policy professionals at the three companies here and, and elsewhere. We're really lucky to work in a community of folks that are really proactive, really committed to doing things the right way across the industry. And so I think that's really a, a hidden strength of the industry. I think we have a lot of people that have seen how technology companies can do things the wrong way and realize what's at stake here and are really committed to, to being proactive. The second thing I'd say is just, yeah, I've been in the autonomous trucking industry for about six years. I've been in the AV industry for close to a decade. Just that I'd impress upon your listeners that there really has been this shift in the AV industry from, from passenger cars to trucks. I think there's a growing consensus that trucks are really going to be the first widespread commercial application of, of self-driving technology. I think there's a clear business case for it. It's a simpler operational design domain. And so while there's been a lot of hype and excitement about how AVs can impact our commutes to work and things like that, I think the real impact is going to be felt by folks as goods start to get cheaper, as the highways start to get safer because there aren't these massive truck accidents. And so it might not always be visible to the average person going about their business, just like you don't think about trucks a lot of times in your regular daily life, but it's starting to have a really big impact and we're really excited to see how the industry progresses. And you are right. What I've been saying for a while now, we are in the midst of the great pivot to trucking, but I want to give you guys, Kodiak, Too Simple, and Embark a lot of credit. You were focused solely on trucks since day one. You saw the opportunity before other companies. You didn't take shortcuts. You didn't get an investor flipping out. Hey, guys, there's no money in robo-taxes. we got to go to trucking. No, 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 no. You went on day one into trucking. You're doing really great things. And the three of you gentlemen are absolute rock stars for what you're doing from a policy perspective. It's impressive. It's impressive. And a lot of other companies on the robo-taxi side can learn from the incredible work that you gentlemen are doing on the policy side in trucking because you're doing it right. You get along. And my God, you're doing a fantastic job. Jordan, your closing thoughts, please. Other than, wow, I'm quite flattered, Grayson. That was pretty lovely of you. To hear that. No, listen, I think, first of all, just to, to echo all I completely agree. By the way, it's so nice to be able to be on this call with, with people who, who believe in what this industry can be and are all committed to making it happen and making it happen fundamentally safely. And I think that's the last point I want to double click on. There's a lot of people in this industry. It's, it's nice that policy people get the opportunity to talk on these podcasts. A lot of my engineers don't get that opportunity. A lot of my ops people don't get that opportunity. A lot of my safety drivers don't get that opportunity. What I want to say is a huge thank you to everyone in this industry who keep, who always keeps safety as their fundamental North Star, who works really hard, who really believes in what we're going to do and never take shortcuts and always makes things safe. You know, the safety records of the three companies on these call on this call and the other company f- focused on autonomous trucks really underscores that. And so that's really what I want to say, which is a huge thank you to everybody who works really hard and tirelessly to make this technology happen, to get this technology on the roads and to make roads safer. You're 100% right. It is a, a team effort. And I know Andreas on your on your team, and he's an incredible engineer. And you, all, all, all of you individuals have, have great individuals on your teams. And Robert, you went to a baseball game recently. So come on, time to close. We got the closer up here. Let's, let's close it out, sir. All right. Shameless plug. Go Padres. You know, <laughs> this could be our year, as they say. First, Grayson, thank you. You've been you are early in on trucks. There's been a few folks that are a part of our ecosystem that is, and you are definitely one of those, not just for Too Simple, but the whole industry. So thank you for what you do, educating your listeners out there on the, the advantages of AV trucks. And obviously echo what Johnny and Jordan said, but you know, from a Too Simple perspective, we want to get people excited about the technology. It is going to be truly transformative, but again, it's going to be iterative. It's going to be route specific. It's going to take time and we're doing it with our partners, 100 year companies, 120 year companies with our state DOTs. There's no one out there just hacking our way to this type of technology. So when it comes to public trust and we, we understand we have to build that public trust and something that is a core of my belief is and of these other companies on this call is transparency and safety. We have to do this together. And we luckily we are B2B as we've, t- we've talked about and there's a huge market out there. 
but we also need to educate the motoring public about around the benefits. And, and you'll be seeing a lot from Too Simple and a lot from our associations, and I'm sure a lot from Kodiak and Embark as well, again, as the educating that broader market on the benefits of and truly transformative technology that autonomous trucks will bring in the next few years. Autonomous trucking is doing things right. Embark, Johnny, your team is doing things right. Jordan, your team at Kodiak is doing things right. Robert, your team at Two Simples doing right. You are three fantastic individuals, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the road to autonomy to share your insights with us today because the future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is autonomous trucking. So Robert, Jordan, Johnny, thank you gentlemen so, so much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Grayson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O dot com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice. <laughs>